Today we'll be in Job chapter 18, and as you turn there in your own Bibles, I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, we ask that your Spirit would be moving powerfully among us in every place that we open up your Word. Be there to teach us, to change us, to form us in accordance with your Word and in accordance with the life of your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, we are in Job in chapter 18 today. This is, uh, this is one of Job's friends. He has these three friends who have come to, to comfort him. Um, and this is, the friend's name is Bildad. And it's his second speech today in the book of Job. And as we know, the, the, these friends have been relatively poor comforters. Actually, not relative. They've been absolutely poor comforters. Um, but they, they all are operating out of the same sort of worldview or mindset or theology um, as Job probably did initially. But this, this is changing Job. But that initial sort of mindset is what you might call um, a retributive theology. In other words, good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. That's the mindset of Job's friends. And, and each one of their, the friends has a variation on that same mindset. So we saw Eliphaz a few weeks ago, and Eliphaz's mindset is just like the others. Good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. Well, we've got Job, and bad things are happening to him. But Eliphaz's take on it is to say, Job, you're not that bad. You're a pretty good person, in fact. So all this bad stuff that's happening to you is going to be over with soon. Cheer up, buddy. Look forward to the future. That's Eliphaz's line of of reasoning. On the other extreme end of of this kind of thinking is Zophar, who we have seen one speech already. We haven't gotten to Zophar's second speech, but Zophar is almost cruel in his administration of this worldview. Zophar actually says in chapter 11, verse 6, to Job, he says, God forgets part of your iniquity. Yeah, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, but Job, these bad things are happening to you and you're not even getting half of what you really deserve. So Zophar's almost cruel in in the way he addresses his friend. So you've got Eliphaz who's sort of soft and Zophar who's really hard. And Bildad takes this sort of middle position. And he too believes that bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. But his contention for Job is that, that though bad things are happening to him, they don't have to keep happening to them. Bildad likes to put up this picture of of a wicked person, of a sinner, and his destruction and his end as a sort of cautionary tale. And that's what we'll see today, that that Bildad describes this cautionary tale in hopes that his friend Job will repent of his sin and, and come and be made righteous. The problem is that for all three of the friends, the theology is too simple. The worldview is too black and white when 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 real life is lived in shades of gray. And so we'll see that today. We begin in chapter 18, where at at first Bildad responds to what Job has said. So let's read there. Job 18, beginning in verses 1 to 4. Then Bildad the Shuite responded, How long will you hunt for words? Show understanding, and then we can talk. Why are we regarded as beasts, as stupid in your eyes? Oh, you who tear yourself in anger, For your sake is the earth to be abandoned or the rock to be moved from its place? So these initial remarks are are Bildad responding to what Job has said. Job has said, you guys are terrible comforters. You're not helping me at all. And, And Bildad feels insulted. And so he makes these remarks. Why do why do we seem like stupid animals to you, Job? Bildad actually accuses Job of being willing to tear down the whole world just for the sake of winning an argument. He says in verse 4, For your sake is the earth to be abandoned. And and remember Bildad's theology. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Bad things are happening to you, Job. So it must be the case that you're a sinner. You need to repent. You need to stop doing this. Why Why can't you see this, Job, Bildad might say? But understand that there's irony written in these verses because Job is coming to understanding. He is being being flexed and changed and molded so that he knows more about who God is and who he is. The one who's stubbornly resisting is Bildad. There's irony in these verses because it's not not Job that, that refuses to change for the sake of letting the whole world be torn down. It's Bildad. 
That's Bildad. Bildad knows that Job is a good man, which is interesting. In, verse, in, in his first speech, chapter 8, verse 20, Bildad says this of Job, God will not reject a man of integrity. Bildad knows that Job is a good man, and yet he sees these bad things happening to Job and refuses to acknowledge that maybe his way of thinking about the world is wrong. He would rather lose his friendship than change his worldview. Have you ever known someone have you ever known someone who refuses, who refuses to admit when they're wrong? It reminds me of the, the husband who said to his wife, now, sweetheart, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Sweetheart, you have a problem admitting wrong. And the wife looks at her husband and says, oh, no, honey, I have absolutely no problem admitting when you're wrong. <laughs> this is, the, this is the, the thought of Bildad. He, he doesn't see any wrong in himself. He only can see it in, in Job. The thing that's interesting is that for every one of us, it's hard to admit when we're wrong. It's just something that, that's difficult for humans to do. Have you ever tried, if you're a Democrat, have you ever tried to convince your Republican friends of all the ways that they're missing the point, they're wrong, they, they, they present all the evidence, or maybe the other way around, you're a Republican and you try to talk your Democrat friends into seeing the error of their ways. It's hard to do, isn't it? In fact, it's probably impossible. Very rarely do people change their political affiliations based on simply being presented facts and arguments. Why? Because there's something fundamental about the way we see the world and the way we associate right and wrong uh, in our sort of political leanings and the ways that we were even raised. It goes even further when you're trying to convince someone who is not a Christian to become a Christian. There's a lot at stake there. If they were to come to a point where they admit that Christianity is true and that it's right and that it's good, that admission comes along with the, another sort of implicit admission that, that we've been living in a way that's wrong all this time. Nobody, nobody is comfortable admitting that they're wrong. In fact, Jesus even says that with regards to coming to him as, as Christ, as Savior, that it's impossible with men. The Bible describes in many different places the hearts of men as hearts of stone, as stiff-necked people. We refuse to admit when we're wrong. And the heart can't be changed that easily, especially not something as fundamental as, as the way you see the world. Only God can do that changing. Jesus says, with men it's impossible, but with God it's not. God can change the human heart. I want us to, before we move from these verses, also understand this, not, not, not to miss the irony that is built into these verses, that it's Bildad who is in fact the hard-hearted one, the one that refuses to change. And as we think about people in our lives who just refuse to admit when they're wrong, I think we should ask ourselves the question, is, is the irony washing over on us? Are we, in fact, the ones who need to be changed? I, I want to pose this question to you. Are you willing to change your mind? Are you willing to admit you're wrong when it comes down to, to worldview issues? It's interesting that, yeah, this is a book about Job, but at least in part, at least in this chapter, it's also about Bildad. Job is, Job is suffering, and, and, and Bildad is brought into the suffering of Job for a reason that ultimately Job redeems his friends, and through, the, through his suffering, his friends come to a clearer understanding of who God is. And I wonder if, if, if we think about that when people come into our lives who are suffering. We often will think, well, someone comes in, God brings people into our lives who are suffering so that we can help them. But let's not rule out the fact that maybe God brings people who are suffering into our lives, not for their sakes, but for ours. That we can learn something from the suffering of others, that we can have our, our views of what's right and wrong about how the world works challenged by the people that God brings into our lives. And we have to ask ourselves the question, not just are we willing to instruct them in what's right and wrong, but are we willing to be instructed by the, the Word of God, by the Spirit of God working in our lives? Are we willing to admit we're wrong? Are we willing to have our worldview challenged and, and changed?
to have our paradigm shifted. It's interesting how that can happen through the suffering of other people. And it's not of little consequence that when we do sin, that we are drawn to the suffering of another, to the suffering of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll go on and look at the last, uh, the last half of the chapter here, last part of the chapter. Um, chapter 18, verses 5 to 21. Indeed, the light of the wicked goes out, and the flame of his fire gives no light. The light in his tent is darkened, and his lamp goes out above him. His vigorous stride is shortened, and his own scheme brings him down, for he is thrown into the net by his own feet, and he steps on the webbing. A snare seizes him by the heel, and a trap snaps shut on him. A noose for him is hidden in the ground, and a trap for him on the path. All around, terrors frighten him and harry him at every, and hurt, harry him at every step. His strength is famished, and calamity is ready at his side. His skin is devoured by disease. The firstborn of death devours his limbs. He is torn from the security of his tent, and they march him before the king of terrors. There dwells in his tent nothing of, of his. Brimstone is scattered on his habitation. His roots are dried below, and his branch is cut off above. Memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name abroad. He is driven from the light into darkness and chased from the inhabited world. He has no offspring or posterity among his peoples, nor any survivor where he sojourned. There in the west, they in the west are appalled at his fate, and those in the east are seized with horror. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is not the place of him who does not, and this is the place of him who does not know God. So in these verses, we get this just elaborate and, and even poetic um, cautionary tale that Bildad presents to Job about what the life of a sinner, what the life of a wicked person looks like. What's always stunning to me about, Bild about these friends is they're, they're cast in a negative light, not because of what they say is, is untrue, but because of their application of it to Job. Because what... what what Bildad says here from a certain perspective is absolutely true. Those who are totally wicked, this is true of their life. They're going to be pursued by the wrath of God both in this life and in eternity. Think about Satan himself, the, the prince of darkness, the, 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 the king of wickedness. These things are true of him. God's wrath will be against him both now and forever. So there's a certain sense in which what Bildad says is true. The problem is that when we try to apply these truths in an absolute way to humans, it never works out that way. Why? Because nobody's all wicked and nobody's all righteous. And so it's hard to take these absolutes and apply them in such a, a black and white way. I want to read to you from the New Testament in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2 where Paul is basically making this, this argument. Here's what he says in the first, well, the, all of chapter 2 is about this, but in the first three verses, here's what he says. Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And he goes on to, to say that, that there are these Jews who know what's right, and sometimes they practice it and sometimes they don't, but they have the law so that they know what's right. And then he compares them to Gentiles, and Gentiles don't have the law, but they sometimes do what's right anyway. And then they sometimes do what's wrong. And so whether you have the law or not, we sometimes do what's right, and we we sometimes do what's wrong. And so with these mixed bags, it's, it's, it's tough, though, when we're looking at Bildad's speech here, because he's right. This is the fate of the wicked. The problem is all of us fit into that category. This is part of the problem with, um, with the mischaracterization of Christianity in general. Those who reject Christ, and even sometimes those people who call themselves Christians, the mischaracterization that they make. Many, many people think that Christianity is this method to take basically good people 
uh, um, who do bad sometimes, but do good sometimes, and help them do more good more of the time. And that's the, what a lot of people think Christianity is. Oh, well, it's just you know, a set of principles to help, help you do more good more of the time. The problem with that is, though, that it still leaves us doing some bad some of the time. It still leaves us as sinners in the category of, 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 of broken, of sinful. Bildad condemns Job, and again, the irony of this is that if he's, if he's putting Job into this category of sinner, he has to put himself there too. He can't exactly point the finger at Job and say, you're suffering all this because you're a sinner, and then look at himself and say, well, I'm not. None of us can. The interesting, or the, the, one of the important aspects for us as Christians, is that we do this, whether we realize it or not, in the, the modern church. People look at the church and they think that this is what it's about. The church saying, you're a sinner. And the, the, that what's implicit in that judgment, you're a sinner, is that they're saying, look at me, I'm not a sinner. But again, this is the mischaracterization of Christianity. We, we do make judgments, friends. We do judge sin. Some people think, well, Christians, they shouldn't judge. No, we do. But we can't do it by saying, you're a sinner. Look at me as the example of those who are not. Instead, what we do is we say, you're a sinner like me. Just like me. I don't don't want you to end up condemned. I want to show you where I found forgiveness. I want to introduce you to the Savior. That's what Christianity is about. Last thing I want us to look at today before we end is some, a couple of remarkable verses here about halfway through the chapter, a little more than halfway. The second half of verse 13 and then into ver- verse 14. Let me read those again for you. The firstborn of death devours his limbs. He's torn from the security of his tent and they march him before the king of terrors. This is a picture of what happens to people when they die apart from God. They are escorted by what's called the, this is an interesting, the firstborn of death. Escorted by the firstborn of death into the gates of hell before the king of terror. Satan, as you read the scriptures and you get to know the the different hues of the Bible, one of the things you're going to see is that Satan mocks God. Satan tries to imitate God in an unholy sort of way. If you look through Revelation, this is maybe the place you can see it the most clear. There are these characters in Revelation, these evil characters. There's the the dragon that mocks God the Father. There is the Antichrist that is the mockery of the Christ. And then there are the, the, the lying spirits and the false prophets that are the mockery of the Holy Spirit that speaks through the prophets. And the same is true here, too. We see this interesting character that death's firstborn, death's firstborn, that is the one who escorts the wicked before the king of terrors. But what is he mocking? Well, in, in Colossians, I think we see, I think we see what's being mocked. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, listen to what's said there. Of Christ... He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. As we're ending today, I want to point out that Bildad is right. That wicked sinners will face the awful fate that he describes in chapter 18. Read through it again if you'd like and see. The awful fate that's described there is the fate of of the wicked until the end, that persist until the end. And the problem is that we're all those sinners. We are all wicked. And so that is the fate of all of us unless 
something changes. The good news that we read in Colossians is that something has changed. Something has changed. One man died and by his own power, because of his own righteousness, came back to life. Jesus is called the firstborn from the dead so that we can have hope that, that He's not the only one born from the dead, that He will come again and raise us too from the dead. And how can that happen? How can we present that good news? Well, we're presenting something today that Bildad could not. The good news of the Gospel. And it begins by doing something that Bildad would not do. And that is admitting that you're wrong. Bildad refused to do this. But if you'll admit that you're wrong, if you'll admit that that you're a sinner, and then put your trust in Jesus Christ, trust Him with your whole life, what you'll find is that you'll follow the one who went to the, to the dead, not to be the firstborn of the dead, but to be the firstborn from the dead. When death comes to you, and your faith is in Him, then the firstborn of all creation will come, and He will usher you, not before the King of Terrors, but before the King of glory. And you'll live forever in His eternal joy. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of His people. Amen.